the goal of my talk today is to show you how scaling can provide insight into mechanisms of diverse behavioral systems, ranging from competition to cooperation. The reason I study behavior is because I think it's this really fascinating link between physiology and the environment. On the one hand, behavior integrates all of the inner workings of the animal down to the tissue, cell, and genetic level, and it connects those processes with how that animal interacts with the outside world. At the same time, the behavior of one organism generates a complex dynamic environment for other individuals, so I see behavior as a process that really unifies levels of biology. I want to start by sharing with you a one minute scene that was very similar to something that cemented my interest in, in studying how behavior works and how it evolves. So imagine that you're an undergraduate student working on a field study and on your first day of work, you see something like this. These birds are lance-tailed mannequins. The two on the right are males and the one on the left is a female. This video was taken by Emily Duval and her lab at Florida State University. In this species, um, the, the males pair together and perform this remarkably complex series of flight maneuvers just so that one of them might have a chance to mate. So this is an example of a behavior, flight, that's key to the survival and dispersal of birds, and it's been adapted for these additional complex functions in this lineage. These behaviors are not just fascinating to watch, they're also important. And I'm going to illustrate why with two examples. This first one is from an art installation that recreates bird collisions with windows, which are the second largest human-caused source of wild bird mortality. If we want to prevent these negative things from happening, we need to understand the control systems that guide bird flight. At the same time, Mechanisms of behavior can also inspire us. We can learn from diverse strategies that have been honed over millions of years of evolution to perform functions that we'd like to be able to emulate. The framework that I want to focus on today for understanding behavior is scaling. This is a framework that was originally developed for studies of the relative sizes of different body parts, like the data you see here illustrating the allometry of beetle wing length with body size. Scaling can be carved up into levels of analysis. Morphologists can choose to look at ontogenetic scaling, looking at the changes within individuals through time. We can look at static scaling, which would be comparing between individuals within a species. Or we can look at evolutionary scaling, which is comparing between different species. And these levels represent both the questions we ask and the measurements they require. This framework is a lot broader than morphological allometry. It can help us understand many different biological mechanisms. And so for the purpose of this talk, I want to consider scaling as any change in structure and function of a system with scale. In this broader framework, I want to propose that we can think of the highest level of um, variation here as considering variation among groups, which might include species. And although we typically begin our investigations by focusing at one of these levels, I want to convince you that studies that span multiple levels of variation are needed for mechanistic understanding. And the reason is that mechanism at one level is responsible for patterns at another. Scaling relationships are especially challenging when it comes to behavior. And some of the reasons for this are that it can be difficult to identify what to measure about a behavior that would be comparable across um, different individuals, different species. And behavior is also noisy. And by that, I mean it's highly variable and it's under the influence of a large number of factors. 
So what I want to show you today is two examples from my research that illustrate how we can leverage large sample sizes and computational power to overcome these challenges. For the first part of my talk, I'm going to focus on a study that addresses the causes of behavior in a highly competitive system. And for the second part, I'll move to a study that addresses the drivers of behavior in a cooperative system. Although these two studies cover very different questions and approaches, they both illustrate how analyses that dissect variation at multiple levels can provide key insight into mechanisms. Okay, so the first project I want to dive into looked at what are the proximate causes of maneuverability. Maneuverability is a hallmark of powered flight, and it's defined as the ability of an animal to change speed and direction. Maneuverability is used when escaping predators, capturing prey, courting mates, as you saw uh, with the mannequins, and it can be taken to extremes when animals are competing fiercely for resources. Selection on maneuvering behavior is predicted to recruit a variety of underlying traits. For flying animals, these traits may include morphology and muscle capacity. And maneuverability is also expected to be influenced at approximate level by the animal's surroundings, the social and physical environment. The question that my collaborators and I sought to address is how do body size, wing morphology, and muscle capacity determine an animal's maneuvering performance? on a wide range of different maneuvers. The hummingbird family was an amazing opportunity to test this question, for one thing because they're so incredibly agile, but also because there are over 300 species that vary in body size and shape. For example, you can consider this uh, stripe-throated hermit that weighs three grams and can lift an additional three grams of weight in flight, versus this Rivoli's hummingbird that weighs nine grams and can lift an additional 18 grams. Understanding how morphological scale affects maneuverability is challenging because there's so many different ways to maneuver, and a given trait might have different effects on different behaviors. For example, if you're a hummingbird with very long, narrow wings, your banked turns are expected to be more aerodynamically efficient, but with long, narrow wings, it would be less efficient for you to increase your wing flapping speed in order to accelerate. So what we needed to answer this question is a way to capture performance on a suite of different voluntary behaviors under consistent standardized conditions. So my co-authors Paolo Segre, Doug Altschuler, and I developed a method to do this in 2015 using an automated tracking system. This system captures changes in body position shown in blue as well as body orientation shown in red. To analyze maneuvers, we break down these data streams to extract units of behavior. And these units are computationally defined using peaks of translational and rotational velocities in the data. So these units represent maneuvers, and they can be classified into three broad ge uh, geometric categories, body translations, body rotations, and complex turns. We define complex turns as maneuvers that combine elements of translational and rotational performance. In this short example sequence, you can see that the bird began with a maneuver where it raised its body orientation toward vertical. Um, it later made a sharp turn, followed by a deceleration in the horizontal plane, and finished with a smooth arcing turn. This is just one very short sequence out of um, hours of recordings. We recorded each bird for up to two hours in this assay, and we would capture thousands of these maneuvers from each bird. So these are five examples of deceleration maneuvers from a single bird, showing you the profile of deceleration in the horizontal plane over time. And from each maneuver, we calculate the peak value of deceleration achieved, which you can see varies greatly from one maneuver to the next. Our goal was to estimate individual differences from these very noisy behaviors. And so one of the first practical questions that we had to tackle is, Given that these are voluntary behaviors, what is the best measure of an individual's intrinsic performance? What would you use? Would you use the maximum value of a sample of maneuvers from a bird, or would you use the sample mean? So on the next few slides, I want to show you a simulation to answer this question. 
in this simulation, let's assume that we're sampling these highly variable acceleration maneuvers from different individuals, and each individual has a latent underlying distribution of performance values with an intrinsic max, and that's what's shown in the middle of the slide here. So we're sampling from this underlying distribution, and we draw our samples to, uh, that we end up using for measurement, and that's what we see on the right. So we want to calculate something that will be the best estimate of the true intrinsic differences between these two individuals. And let's not just look at two. Let's consider 20 different individuals, a typical sample size, and let's compare how well we do at capturing the underlying variation when we use the sample max versus the sample mean. So let's first look at repeatability. So let's imagine repeating our simulated sample, sampling procedure twice, and we'll look at a range of sample sizes along the x-axis of this graph, and we'll compare analyses of the mean versus analyses of the max. And what we find is that the sample mean is highly repeatable at moderate to large sample sizes, whereas the sample max is not repeatable, not even when we have 1,000, 5,000 or more samples or maneuvers per bird. We can also ask whether these measures capture variation in the true latent maximal performance of these individuals by looking at, at that correlation. Um, and so that's what we're going to plot over on the right here, the correlation coefficient of our measurement with the true latent max. And what we see is that the sample mean is highly correlated with an individual's true maximal performance, whereas the sample max is not. So in fact, the maximum of a voluntary sample will not successfully capture variation among individuals. So this carries some practical advice for anyone measuring noisy variable phenotypes, and that's to collect large sample sizes and verify that your measurements are repeatable when you expect them to be. So we did this with the hummingbirds. Um, we took the mean of a large number of maneuvers as each bird's performance metric, and, and we did this for, for all of the different maneuvers and performance metrics we were um, evaluating. And what we found was that when birds were assayed a second time, uh, often many days later, most of our performance metrics were highly repeatable across a broad range of maneuver types. So this is telling us that some individuals consistently accelerate, decelerate, rotate, and turn faster than each other uh, than others on average. These repeatable metrics included many features of um, the bird's smooth arcing turns and sharp turns, um, as well as their, their rotations and, and, and their uh, horizontal translations. We also found that hummingbirds um, differ in their choice of the different types of complex turns. Some individuals consistently use sharp turns, whereas others don't. So overall, what this told us was that individuals differ in a suite of correlated maneuvering performance metrics, and we can capture repeatable measures of this variation using a standardized assay. Okay, so to come back to our morphological question, we applied this method to hummingbirds from 25 different species that exhibit a range of morphologies. And I have to acknowledge my co-author, Paolo Segre, who led the tremendous fieldwork for this project and filmed over 200 hummingbirds at several sites throughout Central and South America. After each bird was tested in the flight chamber, its body mass was measured, its wings were photographed, and we used those photographs to measure wing loading, which is a measure of relative wing size based on body mass divided by wing area. And we measured aspect ratio, which is a measure of how elongated the shape of the wing is relative to its area. And from previous studies by my co-author Doug Altschuler, we had measures of burst muscle capacity for each of the species in our analysis. To quantify muscle capacity, a hummingbird wears a harness that's attached to a string of beads and it gets released from the bottom of a chamber. And this clip shows you what that looks like. As the bird tries to escape, it flies up and it has to lift more and more beads as it flies. And so it's possible for us to measure how much weight a bird is able to lift. We used a multi-level analysis that estimated relationships between maneuvering performance metrics and uh, morphological and muscle traits at both the within and the among species level. And it was important to incorporate both of these levels of variation 
because these scaling relationships can diverge in informative ways. For example, we can hypothesize that body mass might be negatively related to performance, both within and among species, species as, as shown at the bottom of the slide here, but it's also possible that body mass could be negatively related to performance within species, but positively related to performance among species as you see up here. And one way this top scenario can occur is because of the correlated evolution of other influential traits that differ among these species. So I'm going to show you our results, focusing first on models that looked only at relationships with body mass. So the predictors in this model were the body mass of a species and the body mass of an individual relative to the species mean. I'm going to um, populate this matrix to show you the associations and the rows in this matrix represent our different maneuvering performance metrics and the columns are our two predictors. And I'm going to fill it in with some bubbles and, and um, these represent effect sizes. Blue bubbles represent positive associations, red negative, and larger, darker bubbles represent stronger effects. Okay, so we found that hummingbird species with greater body mass perform faster translations, faster rotations, and faster smooth turn centripetal accelerations. However, within a species, heavier individuals perform more slowly on many of the same maneuvers. To determine the reason for this scaling result, our next step was to rerun the analysis, adding in muscle capacity and wing morphological traits as additional predictors. So let's dig into the reason why by looking at all of those traits. And I'm going to show you those in this matrix. And so what we found was that performance on this top set of maneuvering performance metrics was mainly attributed to differences in species muscle capacity. The species with greater muscle capacity had faster translations and faster smooth turn centripetal accelerations. However, these two rotational speeds and um, the types of turns a bird used were largely attributed to wing loading. The birds with, um, with uh, or species with greater relative wing size used faster rotations and more sharp turns. We also found that a species body mass is not a major driver here. Larger species in our sample have achieved greater maneuverability primarily as a result of their elevated muscle capacity and or wing size. So we can return to our original question about the causes of maneuverability and conclude that for one thing, different maneuvers rely on different biomechanical traits. And although increases in body size are generally detrimental for an individual. In the evolutionary history of hummingbirds, some larger species have compensated for this by exaggerating the scale of their other traits. Now these findings raise many more questions that we're really excited to explore next. For example, we're interested in understanding how selection for resource monopolization might favor a combination of morphological, behavioral, and performance traits. And another follow-up to our work on maneuverability is asking about the relationship between maneuvering performance and other higher order features of behavior. As a brief preview, some of our recent data suggests that a combination of small body size and extreme agility may exacerbate the risk of mortality from collisions in cities. And you can learn more about our current work in talks presented at this meeting by my students, Aaron and Ilias. Okay, so for the next part of my talk, I want to shift away from the scaling of behavior with respect to the size of morphological structures and move to a very different kind of problem and ask, how does the scale of a society influence behavior? And there's no better time than a pandemic to think about the importance of social interactions, social structure, and social scale. If you think about a community of interacting individuals, these interactions can be characterized as a network made up of nodes connected in a web. And so these nodes represent individuals and the edges are the connections or the relationships or interactions between them. Social networks are non-uniform in humans and animals. We have differences in the connectivity depending on where you look in the network 
and the individuals in the network differ from each other. We also see variation in networks as a whole. So different networks differ in their group level properties, and these include properties of scale. Social networks can vary in scale in a number of ways. Groups can vary in terms of the number of individuals that make up the group, and that's represented on these little diagrams by the number of nodes around these circles. Groups can also vary in terms of the density of ties or relationships, ranging from sparsely connected networks to very densely connected networks. And as an analogy to understand what I mean by density, you can think of these networks as um, like a circle of pegs that you're lacing together with string. Density is a measure of how many of the pegs you connect with your string out of the maximum number of possible connections you could form. A third way that networks vary in, in scale is in terms of the rate of social interactions. Um, and that's illustrated here by the thickness of these edge lines. And so in my analogy of pegs that you're lacing together, you can think of um, this par uh, parameter as measuring the thickness of the string or the strength of the string that you're using. So all of these properties are also dynamic in time. And so a major question is how do features of scale influence the behavior of individuals and the dynamics of the entire system as a whole? So to address this question, my collaborators and I have been studying a species of mannequin called the wire-tailed mannequin. And like the birds that you saw at the beginning of this talk, male wire-tailed mannequins form partnerships with other males. In the wire-tailed mannequin, the dominant males will invite other males to come into their territories to perform complex motor displays. And I'm going to show you what they do, or at least a small part of what they do in this um, very short video clip. What you're seeing here is a pair of males initiating one of these interactions. So previous work by Brant Ryder and, and other co-authors has shown that in the wire-tailed mannequin, male social behavior is associated with fitness. Young males with more social partners are more likely to acquire a territory which they need in order to mate. And also territory holders with more social partners sire more offspring. So it's good for a mannequin to have friends. To study the dynamics of these social networks, we use an automated tracking system. Each male in the population is outfitted with a lightweight transmitting tag and receivers are placed at each display territory to record tens of thousands of hours of behavior um, over several years. And what we get is a very detailed data set that tells us who interacted with whom and how often. What you're seeing here is a small subset of data from our population. These results are, are shown for one particular lek over one particular six day recording period. A lek is an area where males come to display and where females come to evaluate potential mates. In the wire-tailed mannequin, the leks typically have between three to 10 display territories and a group of anywhere from five to 30 or more males interacting with each other. Because we monitored over 150 individual males across 11 LECs, we were able to quantify these behaviors at both the individual level and the group level. Furthermore, because we monitored each LEC repeatedly through time, we were able to measure stability as the degree to which social relationships within a group persisted from one time point to the next. So we have examples of mannequin groups that were highly stable and some that were relatively unstable. And so this allows us to ask whether this group level property of social stability is predicted by features of scale. Well, when we analyzed group level stability, we found that it was largely explained by two factors that have to do with scale. And I'm going to show you those results in these graphs where higher values on the Y axis indicate that a social network was more stable. And the points, each point in these graphs represents an observation of a single LEC social network. So we found that the more stable groups 
had stronger connections between the dyads, so pairs interacted more frequently, but they had fewer of them. In other words, it was the sparse networks that were the most stable. To try to understand why that might be, we next delved into the patterns at the individual level, which we expect to be driving these group level phenomena. So in this graph, we're looking at individuals and we're looking at, um, on the x-axis, how many social partners a male had in a particular recording session. And does this predict the stability of his partnerships in the, um, the following time? And so we found that the more densely connected males that are towards the right on this uh, graph were better at maintaining their social partnerships. And yet when we examine the dynamics within individuals, we see something very different. Um, on the graph on the far right, we see that times when a male had relatively more partnerships, more than his typical number, he was less able to maintain them. So it demonstrates that individuals experience a trade-off between quantity and stability. I want to highlight that this trade-off wouldn't be obvious if we only looked at the among or between individual level. So to unify these results and to link these individual level mechanisms to group level processes, we built a model. And in our model, we assumed a few simple rules. We assumed that a social interaction has to be mutual. We assumed that individuals prefer some partners more than others, and that previous partners are the most preferred. And lastly, we assumed that there were consistent di uh, differences among individuals. In other words, some individuals are predictably more social than others. And with just these three simple assumptions, our simulation model exhibited the same scaling patterns that we observed in the mannequins. In contrast, when we simulated a null model where partnerships were formed randomly or where we broke one or more of the rules in our individual base model, we don't capture these same scaling dynamics. So this tells us that if a mannequin wants to maintain his social partnerships, there's a downside to having too much connectivity, to being connected too broadly. Um, although this threshold of what is too much will vary from one individual to the next. And so um, this trade-off also drives group level patterns. I think these results are especially interesting in light of the massive changes in the connectivity of human social systems and the rate of social interactions that have occurred during our lifetime. If you want to learn more about mannequins and what this amazing group of birds can tell us about mechanisms of behavior and evolution, you should attend the special symposium at this meeting, S12, organized by Blake Jones and Ignacio Moore. And in our own work, one of the follow-up questions we've been investigating with the wire-tailed mannequins is testing whether individuals really do prefer reciprocal partners, as our model proposes. And to hear more about that, you can come to my student Paisley's presentation in session 16. In my lab at Carleton University in Canada, we're also interested in extending our work on networks to look at competitive systems. We'd like to know how individual performance traits influence resource monopolization and how these mechanisms of competitive interactions at the individual level and the dyad level scale up to influence the diversity of strategies that can coexist. I want to advertise that I have opportunities for PhD students to join us in Ottawa. To summarize this talk, I hope that I've shown you how a combination of leveraging large sample sizes, repeatable units of measurement, and multi-level scaling can be really useful tools for understanding how complex systems work. And I'll end by thanking my collaborators, my students, technicians, and other sources of support. I look forward to answering your questions on Monday. And if you're watching this as a recording, you can get in touch with me in the virtual conference and on my website. Thank you.